All right, so looking at these four columns on the right now, um, firstly, this fractional predicted area. Well, remember Tom said this morning about the problem with a success rate is that you can be right all the time simply by predicting the whole of the area present. If you just say, well, all of my study region is suitable, then yeah, okay, you're going to be brilliant and you're going to predict that all of your present localities are, are correct, you know, they're, they're correctly predicted, but that is clearly not a useful model. Um, so we need to know something about the proportion of the area that's predicted present. So, this is saying that if you set a threshold of 0 0.09 out, 8, your fractional predicted area will be 0 0.387. So you'll have 38% or so of your study region will be predicted present. That will incorporate all of your present localities. If you increase that, remember, going over the same point again, if you, if you increase that threshold, then your proportion of the study area that's predicted will decrease. So you could work this out in a GIS. You could simply reclass it and then work out the proportion of the landscape that's your study area that's predicted present or, or suitable within the niche. Um, uh, but this is telling you. So if you set this threshold, then 17 or so percent of your study region will be predicted as present. At that threshold, the next column is telling you what the, the emission rate is on your training localities. So I'm glad to see that my emission rate for my training localities at the minimum training presence is zero. Okay? It is always going to be default, uh, it is always going to be zero by default because we've set it like that. We've said what's the threshold that we can use that will give us zero emission rate, right? That's what we've just been talking about. So that value should always be zero, and I'm glad to see that, that it is in, in, in this case. Um, but if we increase that threshold, if we allow 10% of our training or our calibration and tra training points to be um, emitted from the prediction, so our emission rate is 10% of the calibration, then we are going to start emitting some of our um, training points, of course, and um, that value should be very close to 10% or 0.1, and, and it is. It's not exactly, if we had a 100,000 points, then it would basically be exactly 0.1. We don't have enough points to get it exact, but it is essentially, you know, by default, it is setting this value here to be about 0.1, as close to 0.1 as it can get with the number of localities that you have. Okay? So those values aren't really very informative, particularly in this case, because they are used to set the threshold. But the next column is a lot more interesting. These are the points that the model hasn't seen so far. These are the test points, the 20% of the localities that we pulled out of the model. And um, these are the useful numbers in effect. So this is saying that of those 20% of the points, at this minimum training presence, the emission rate is still zero. So none of those points are emitted from the prediction. That's not always the case. That's not set by default. That's a kind of nice result in many ways. Um, but that's saying that our emission rate stays very low when our emission rate is set to zero for the calibration points. Okay. So sometimes that will creep up and you'll get a few points. If some of your test points are ecologically very dissimilar to your calibration points or your training points, then you might start getting some emission here. If we look at the test emission rate when we had using the 10 percentile training presence or the 10 percent emission rate, so it's, again, it's, it's 10 percent emission there and thereabouts for the training, but in this case we're going to emit 30 percent of our points. So it figures that we might expect to emit a few more points from the test data because the model hasn't seen that yet, and that figures that, that our emission rate then has gone up to about 30 percent. So 30 percent of our test points were emitted from the prediction. If we had 100 points, 30 of them would have been um, emitted from the prediction. Okay. This last column are the binomial probabilities. So these are what Tam talked about today, this idea of a, a kind of null hypothesis that is our model any better than a random prediction. So it's saying that the probability of, being, of, of getting this uh, emission rate based on this 
fractional area. If each time we, 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 we run a test, we have a 17% chance um, or a 0.171 chance uh, probability of being successful, then the chance of being successful in effect 70% of the time or unsuccessful 30% of the time is a very low number. Okay, so that's your p value. This is giving you an exact p value, but you would usually not need to refer to the exact p value, you would simply state that it is or is not, not significant. And of course, the criteria that we commonly, by convention, really use for that is, is, is a 5%, is a not a p value, of, is, it, is it less than 0.05? So if our model is less, if, if our p value is next less than 0.05, which it, it clearly isn't in this case, then we would be able to say that at least for this test, which has a bunch of caveats and problems with it, but is, is very commonly used, um, our model is significant. So what we might do is report in a publication or in a, a thesis or in a report that at a given threshold, and for X, Y, and Z reasons, we've selected this threshold. At this threshold, our success rate or our emission, our emission rate was 30%. Or we might say that our success rate was 70 percent, which is exactly the same information, said differently, which was or was not significant. In this case, it was significant. Okay? And there's one other, um, th there are a bunch of thresholds here. These, these fixed cumulative ones are, are related to the cu uh, cumulative probabilities. And I'm not going to, yeah, I, I don't expect that you will using those, I'm not going to try and talk through those now. The only other one that I will mention because we talked about it yesterday is this idea of equal training, sensitivity and specificity. This is not just based on emission rates, so it is not just assuming that you have just presence data, it's taking into account absence data or specifically in, in the way that Maxent is using the data, background data. Okay, so this is again as we heard about earlier, this idea of, 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 of balancing presences and background or presences and absences. So if I go back to yesterday's presentation, remember I said about selecting a threshold of presence only data versus if we know something about absences or what's happening to, to the background or, or pseudo absences in some cases. Remember we're saying, well, what, how, how well are we doing on the, 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 the absences and how well are we doing on the presences as we change the threshold, those go in opposite directions. And this is a, a threshold that we might say, well, let's balance the two. So let's take this point here where they cross. Um, again, we discussed that before, and, 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 and you know, there's plenty of literature out there to read some more about it, but from a very practical sense, that's this value here. So if you wanted to choose this threshold, then this is giving you a value of saying that the logistic threshold that you want to use is not 0.293. This is the fractional of, of you know, 14% of your study area will be predicted present at that threshold, and then as we just discussed. Okay? Alright, pictures of the model. This is um, just a, a, a simple graphic that Max said is basically plotting that ASCII grid that it outputs. Okay? So this is the, 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 the kind of present day prediction, this is the calibration prediction for um, the, our species of, of, of interest. If you plot this, this is exactly the same information, this is exactly the same data that you would plot in QGIS or, or, or your GIS package. It's the same information that's in that ASCII file. Okay? Um, so I'm not going to try and you know, kind of interpret that now. It, 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 it makes sense for this for these, this set of occurrence points. I think this was the this was the elephant. But the, um, so in, in, in the way that Maxent is displaying by default, the, the, the lower probabilities are shown in blue, going through the, 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 the greens, through the yellows, through the oranges and reds, and going up in, in higher probabilities. So you'd expect to see you know, higher probabilities where we had an occurrence records for the species. Okay? This is a great way of just instantly visualizing what does my model look like. If you're presenting this in a report, encourage you to take your ASCII grid file and put this into the GIS and, and, and present a you know, GIS style map where you can put scale bars and more arrows and you can play with the projections and, and, and things like that. This is a simple, straightforward, quick picture of, of that result. 
detail that's visible on this map and it's useful to point out to you guys. You see these smooth curves here, here, see them down here. Anybody know what those are? Boundaries between values in the underlying climate surfaces. And essentially what these programs are doing is kind of integrating over all the different uh, environmental data sets that you gave to them. And that's how you get these nice and more, more synthetic um, outputs. If you ever see that sort of curves in your final outputs when you use threshold, those are very prominent. And that's a good indication that you're working at the wrong spatial resolution of environmental data. Essentially, your environmental data are getting uninformative because they have these kind of fixed sets of values. So it's just a little bit of a warning sign of a bad situation. <clears throat> Thanks, yes, yeah, so it's an important point. They, they are, in effect, artifacts. And if you were to, one thing that, that, that you know, both interested in the species and, and, and looking through this, this particular uh, model, I would be very cautious of those. I certainly wouldn't think, well, this is a model that's, you know, ready for uh, interpretation. And I would try and trace back where that result was coming from. Now, the first thing to do, and you should really have already done this, would be to just visualize all of the input variables, because that information is coming from the input variables. So what you will find, I expect, is that at least one of your variables will have that kind of pattern clearly in it. You might be able to just visualize that if you pull up each of those environmental layers. Um, and what you might be able to then do is find that, you know, there's a couple of layers that simply have these artifacts in them that might be the, the due to um, the way the interpolation of the climate data was done in the first place and a number of reasons, but you might think, well, that therefore is kind of spoiling my model and I, I need to remove those variables and I need to find better variables that I can, I can use to, 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 to provide the model with, with that information. One other thing to point out here is that these, the squares here are your occurrence records, of course. Um, the purple colored ones are those that the model randomly pulled out to use for test data. Okay, so the calibration points are used uh, are shown in, in, in white, and the test points are shown in purple. So the thresholds and the model and everything was calibrated using the white points, and then when, when this surface was created, those purple points were plumped on top. And that's where we did the evaluation. That's where the, the software calculated AUC scores and um, uh, the, the binomial tests and the like. But it, the, the model didn't use those until that point of doing the model evaluation. And you can kind of, there, there are ways within the MapSense software to start, you know, like changing the colors of those blocks and that. And that's useful, but I would say don't start passing with that. Go to the GIS, you're learning how to use GIS, put the data in the GIS, and then you have any kind of limitless flexibility to change the symbols, the colors, the projection, the rest of it. 